Hoja Shipe here. There's another Hoja Shop Thought Bubble. And I thought I would talk about how you, as a person who's participating in the cryptocurrency space, whether you're into Dash, Litecoin, Dogecoin, you're into the tokens, maybe you're holding some Ethereum ER20, hoping some particular token's going to pop. Uh, maybe you support a particular token or for the mere fact that you think the project's going to be something worth um, supporting. Whatever reasons you are, maybe you're into heavy into Bitcoin, you consider it a storage value, a long-term investment, maybe even a short-term investment because you're a big-time trader. Whatever brings you into the space, uh, this year has demonstrated, you know, significant amount of wealth being generated. Uh, a number of individuals have gone on to either create their own businesses, pay down their debt, uh, have a sense of some sort, maybe not absolute certainty, but a sense of, okay, my debt's paid off, like my student loans, which is the biggest uh, hindrance to many millennials you know, moving forward because of that debt, uh, getting into a house, paying off the mortgage. Uh, be able to know there's some sign of financial security to where you're able to have a bit of a a breather, if you will. Nothing's absolutely 100% certain. Shit could happen tomorrow. We can go to war to North Korea. Uh, freaking aliens can drop from the ground. Uh, uh, a freaking Spanish flu-like virus can release, can uh, unleash itself in the world, and I don't know, a fourth of the human population can drop dead. You know, anything could happen. The economy can crash again. Who knows? Um, but basically, barring all that, you can have some kind of, at least, a good strong foundation to what your future could be. And that's the whole purpose of, you know, the creation of Bitcoin, is to have some kind of good base foundational layer to build off of that you have a say in control of your sovereign wealth, that it's not manipulated, it's not, you know, not given, granted by a central authority, it's not a system that you're forced into, it's a system you choose to. And what level you choose to uh, demonstrates what kind of gains you get or even losses you receive. Um, it's all about choices and how you choose, like, you know, those... This may not be a global thing. I think some of it might be global, but there used to be these books in the 80s and early 90s called Choose Your Own Adventure. And you basically had to read um, read the book and you had to choose what your character could do. You had like three different scenarios, so you can have three different outcomes for these books. And, you know, sometimes you can cheat and go towards the end to see what is the best outcome, like if your character lived or won or things like that, or maybe you chose to do a bunch of bad decisions. Kind of like a uh, mass effect, depending on how you uh, chose to make your character, uh, as how the basically from Mass Effect 1 to mostly Mass Effect 2, but all the way into Mass Effect 3. And yes, I know most people are upset by the ending, but how the paradigm shift of your character determined uh, who was still with you, uh, what gains you made, what losses you had, and what the outcome was. It's kind of early, those books were the kind of like the early predecessors for those type of uh, decision based games. And in a sense, while you can't really cheat ahead and figure out your own outcome, you know, cryptocurrency is kind of like a choose your own adventure. So, the reason I'm kind of talking about this is that with these gains, with this additional wealth you may have, maybe you're looking to see what you can do to, um, Maybe give back. It's something that's been part of the cryptocurrency space for a very long time. Two, you know that 2018 is going to be huge. You're going to start now really seriously having friends that were dismissive of you before saying, you know, how do I get into this space? Family members. You're going to have people starting to really come at you beginning in January. Not so much, maybe so a little bit now, but it's the holidays. People are focused on family. They're focused on other things. They're trying to wrap things up for the year. But you're going to start seeing people come at, coming to you. Maybe they'll start coming to you around March is when the first wave of really a significant chunk of the uh, tax returns start coming in the States. Um, 
not sure how the tax system works in all other countries, but we get uh, basically the government taxes us all year long through paycheck to paycheck. And towards the, after you file your taxes and do all your deductions, um, you basically get the, the extra money that you know, the overtax that they did. It's, we have a very weird system. It's, it's stupid. But everyone considers it free money when it's really not, but whatever. So, there could be all sorts of different scenarios or all sorts of reasons why people might be coming to you. And I was thinking maybe there is a better way to help maybe cushion those questions. Maybe even help expand this space better to help get new thinking, new thoughts. Because the more eyes are in the space, the more different types of experiences people have. Uh, they're going to bring different types of perspectives, different types of understanding. Maybe there'll be different types of developers. Um, if you look at any Bitcoin website, business UI, it sucks. It takes a long time for the, the UI. Uh, maybe you have more developers that are more UI centric that can make things a little bit more prettier, a little bit more easier to understand, a little bit easier to navigate. All sorts of reasons why things could be improved in this space. So, oh my God, I'm doing this video and I forgot the most important thing. So here yeah, I am uh, going on and on and I forgot the most important piece of all this, all this speech. So, one of the things that we do as a cryptocurrency space is we already build off of existing systems, even if they are not the best system. For example, we're building off the internet, which is a very cumbersome, it could do better, basically. And many people have thought about that. That's why there's a lot of projects going to seek to decentralize the internet. So it's not heavily centralized. Different avenues are transmitting the information instead of being focusing on fiber optic lines, looking at wireless, mesh networks, things of that nature. But, let's look in here. Uh, uh, come on, I could do it. Ah, uh, no I can't. Yeah, anyways. So, we also, in a sense, build off the existing financial system, the crumbling one. We basically suck the energy out of it and use it to propel our system. Um, so in that spirit, I was thinking, what is an easy way to disseminate information about Bitcoin in a, a massive manner that pe would engage people, that would allow people to learn on their own, have great ease of access and be able to find and seek that knowledge itself. Uh, even with the internet, with like blogs, podcasts, all the YouTube videos, a lot of tutorials, I see an ever increasing uh, how to big, Bitcoin uh, like series, whether it be a combination of videos, lecture, you know, like how to simple tutorial videos, how to lectures, uh, blog posts, those type of things are going on, which is good. Some of them are paid, some of them are free. Um, it's good. It, it allows for people to be able to learn um, in a manner they're accustomed to. It's very, like, college-centric, if you will. Uh, these type of how-to videos, you know, you saw them in the very early days of the Internet. There was a series of VHS uh, tapes and CD-ROMs that you can insert in the computer and help you learn how to you know, turn on the computer, connect the modem, stuff like that. And we need that. We need that in this space. We also need it to be as easy and dead simple. And some of them are not as easy and dead simple at all. But we got to work with the material that we have. We're constantly improving. The more eyes there are in this space, maybe there'll be someone who is talented or has a background in education, looks in and sees the opening in this space and says, I can do this, but I can do it better. And I can make it more palatable for the masses, as they say, to adopt. So, upon thinking about that, upon understanding that and seeking that out, I was thinking to myself, well, how can I spread the good word of Bitcoin? 
And if you saw the preview last night, I showed this book, The Internet of Money, Volume 2, by Andre Antonopoulos. And how you can help spread the good word is a very simple thing. There are libraries. Yes, I said libraries across America. They're publicly funded, uh, they're supported by tax dollars. Uh, they're open, depending on where you are, almost seven days a week, uh, day, morning, night, except for the holidays because they're, you know, they're state operated. They have books, they have audio, they have DVDs, they have access to the internet. They have even meeting places. They have how-to classes. They are a community hub for a lot of people uh, in this country. Uh, if you're in a small town, sometimes the library is like the meeting hall, city hall, things of that nature because of the space. Uh, it was designed or built that way. Um, during the crash, I would often, because I had to, you know, reduce my spending, I, I would go to the library to print up resumes, to uh, send faxes, to uh, use the internet and find jobs, respond to emails, make appointments. Uh, a lot of people did that. It was uh, a lifeline for, and it still is a lifeline for a lot of people. Internet access is not um, as widespread as we like in the States. There are many places where it's still just dial-up. You don't, ha so you can do email maybe. Uh, or you can do email. You can connect, but you can't watch it on Netflix. You can't do YouTube. You can't get the full breadth of the internet. You're very limited. So the library oftentimes is connected to a fiber optic cable, allows you connection, and so you can do those things. You can watch videos, you can get on Netflix, you can uh, have the full breadth of the internet. You'll be able to pay your bills, you're able to check on your banking, you can do all sorts of stuff. I wouldn't probably do the check on your banking in a public access system, but people still do that because it's the only access point for them. And now and now as more and more uh, stuff goes online, they're stopping using paper stuff. They're even stopping putting offices everywhere because everything is done online. So they're reducing their, their overhead, if you will. So the internet for, you know, the internet is the lifeblood of the economy. It is the source of a lot of the revenue, is a great communication device. But not everyone has the convenience of it, if you will. Uh, it's still a difficult access point, whether because of geography, because of corrupted practices of ISPs, whatever the reason it may be. The library is one of those avenues where people are able to use the Wi-Fi for free. They're able to either connect to their mobile devices or laptops, connect to the internet and can gain information but they also use a library for a quick, easy access resources. If you're looking to basically have a basic understanding of something, well, there's a, so many how-to books, how-to novels that go in depth. Not everything's on the internet. Sometimes it's behind paywalls. Sometimes it's very cumbersome to understand and you're constantly wicking terms. But when you can pull a book where someone has already done a good chunk of the work for you and breaks it down for you. So there's still, Libraries still have a function and purpose. You know, there's attendance, there's people and places and things. And not only that, they're everywhere. Um, and the reason why it was everywhere, because it was put as a priority in the 18th century to be everywhere. It was a, having a library was considered a crown jewel for a number of towns. It was a way to, as the West was getting settled, it was a way to encourage people to come to this town, we are civilized, you know? We're not a bunch of ruffian bandits or whatever. We have a library. So you have to see a lot of towns and a lot of small places, uh, their library, if you look at it, is like the best building in the town. Why? Because it was an advertisement to come to this town and live here. Uh, the history library goes back to ancient times, you know, the Greeks, Romans, uh, even China, uh, you know, uh, various different uh, Islamic empires. Everyone pretty much had a need for a library. But, you know, that knowledge is locked up. Much how the access points to the financial system is locked up. 
much like how the ISPs want to kind of lock up the internet with a, the do away of net neutrality. You had to have a subscription for the longest time to get into a library. You could only be a man sometimes to get into a library. Um, but that dramatically changed. Um, in the new world, uh, is believed that here in America, the concept of a public library, which was something very new, where it was free to everybody, was something that was uh, done here. I believe it was uh, a couple of different religious groups, the Quakers, the Mennonites. Um, I want to say the Lutherans. Not positive on that. But the religious groups that came here because they were being per persecuted in Europe established libraries. They made them public and available for everyone. Uh, it became a source of meetings, a source of religious thought, because it was the, kind of the centric thinking down there. And it expanded slowly the concept throughout time. It became a source of pride for a lot of people. When you died, you gave your wealth and money to either the city or to a, a, a group that uh, funded libraries, you had libraries in your name. One of the biggest uh, individuals that supported libraries was Andrew Carnegie. He built over 2,500 of these things uh, throughout the world, most of them in the States, but in England, Ireland, and Canada. And he just went from town to town and said, I will fund your library system as long as you staff it. I'll build the buildings, buy the books, and is open to the public and is free for everyone to utilize. And many uh, towns took up on his offer. There's some that did not because Andrew Carnegie was a controversial figure, how he uh, occurred his wealth, even to this day, was controversial. Some considered it tainted money. Others were concerned by the fact that they would have to allow, like particularly, I saw one story, uh, you know, like in the South, for example, they would have to allow black patrons into their into the library system. So the denial of access, they, they thought that was more important than having a library system paid for them. Eventually, many of these places did open, you know, public libraries. Uh, other places eventually, you know, took the money, built their system, staffed them, and things of that nature. So libraries have always been, particularly in the States, a very important part of the American experience. It's where you go to gain knowledge, it's where you go to, whether you're in university or in school, to write your papers, do your research, you know, just to learn. Maybe to hang out with your friends, find out something new, get the latest, you know, uh, Lee Child's novel. Because maybe you can't necessarily afford to uh, buy uh, books when they come out. Um, even with you use a, like an e-reader. So going to the library, you can check it out. Maybe you don't know if you even want to own the particular book. Or you go through and you pursue and you look and you see a book and you've never heard that author before, but you like the title, you like the book cover, you like the little prescription, it, the script, prescription, the little, the little blurb about what it's about. And you pick it up, you decide, oh, yeah, I did want to own this book. You read it, you turn it back in. So, what I was thinking is that as a person who, you know, maybe not made as many gains as everyone else, but has made some gains, um, is in this space, talks about cryptocurrency all the time, uh, wants to learn more about it, wants to understand it better, wants other people to understand it better so they can make their own decisions for themselves, uh, to be able to, you know, have a say in their sovereign wealth to be able to hold that wealth, to be able to develop it however they want to. You know, this is a voluntary system. Uh, it's a choice system. Uh, figuring out how you want to do that is important. Be able to secure your wealth is important. Understanding the basics is important. I know there's a lot of people that are saying that maybe like the masses are just too stupid to understand crypto. I don't think that's the case. I think what has happened is people have been conditioned for so long that to trust third parties that they know what they're doing, you know, from tax auditors to, uh, you know, people doing your taxes to, you know, the banking system in general, to how, you know, retailers, mortgage brokers, uh, hedge fund people, stockbrokers. All of that to not really understand the nitty gritty aspects of their financial system. 
That's for other people to do. That's why I pay this person to do it. Hi. So, um, so the, so we've been conditioned not to really look, to not to know fully or understand fully. That is too complicated for a, a simple person to understand. And I, I think that's bullshit. I honestly do. I think if we lay the groundwork well enough that people can choose to, to the level of their understanding as long as they're able to see the inner workings. It's kind of like um, when you see like uh, the breakdowns of machines and they like slice them in half and you can see all the gear shifts and you can see how you know a, a, uh, a car works or an engine works or this particular device works or the inner workings of something and you can see the inner workings and you can follow it along and I kind of like those things and those things are fun but I think if we do lay the foundation and saying hey you can learn this it's important to know this it's important to understand all of this you don't have to know it off the top of your head you don't have to have even a hundred percent grasp of our understanding everything but that knowledge is there for you to know is broken down in such a simple way that you can know it, that you can understand it, and you can make better decisions for yourself. Or you can choose not to. But I think it's more important for us to, to make that knowledge available, to make people understand that they can know this, they can understand it. It is not really that complicated that anyone can understand cryptocurrency. Anyone can understand the importance of the blockchain. Anyone can understand the importance of proof of work or proof of stake. Uh, the importance of their private keys, the importance of uh, the different types of you know inputs and outputs, and how fees are done, uh, the importance of the overall structure of the network, you know nodes, SPV wallets, non-mining nodes, the roles of miners, the roles of developers, uh, the code maintainers, the role of GitHub. You know, everything is on GitHub. What happens if GitHub gets shut down? Anyways. Uh, what decentralization, decentralization means? What is, uh, you know, how we got to a decentralization? Peer-to-peer. -peer. All the very various components that make up the cryptocurrency space, that make up the components of Bitcoin, are things that people can understand. The people, things that people can know. So that when they get into this space, they're not just simply handing all their money to Coinbase, keeping it in a, a wallet or a vault, and then hope it's going to be there, you know? Kind of like what they do now with their savings account or their 401k, you know? It doesn't have to be like that. You can do more things. You can have a better understanding. You can choose the different avenues and the path you know, before you, unlike previously, where if you wanted to secure some type of future, there was, you have a limited op set of options. You really do. Like, you know, your 401k and RRA and IRO, you don't have enough capital to maybe invest into the stock market and play the market if you wanted to. Maybe you can only secure one piece of property and that's the property you're living in. You know, things of that nature. So by being able to break these things down, by being able to disseminate this knowledge, by just allowing people to be able to educate themselves either at their own pace in a civilized fashion, is the best way to spread the good word, is the best way to get people to be part of the cryptocurrency space. Simply handing them Bitcoin or Litecoin is not sufficient enough. Um, we, gotta, we gotta step up our game. We're, there's a lot of people there's a lot of interests that want to make sure the cryptocurrency does not succeed, does not exist. So, I don't know why I decided not to uh, work. So, here we go. So, one of the ways, one of the avenues, as I was saying about libraries and how they're everywhere in existence, and particularly in the States, how they're the crown jewel and the center of the community. And people still to this day go there. In fact, millennials use the library more than any other previous generation before them. And they are the bulk of the users of the cryptocurrency space. So if you want to reach, you know, your cousin, your friend that has 
you know, brush you off for a little bit, even with Bitcoin being at 11,000. One of the ways you can do it is by placing a book in the library system. And how you do that is three ways. One, you can go to your local library and you can go, hey, I want to put a customer request. I want to say that this particular book, The Internet Money Volume 2 or The Internet Money Volume 1, Hold on, there's some activity going on here. Uh, that this book should be in the library system. And they'll put that request, and, it, and that takes a little bit of time. The second way to do that is to go Friends of the Library. Friends of the Library is an association that's been around since pretty much the creation of libraries in the, in the uh in the Americans, basically. They fund, support, help fundraise for libraries, bring uh, aid for everybody, buy books, buy DVDs, bring lectures. Uh, they've been associated and helping in creating new libraries, supporting libraries in general, particularly when there's budget cuts, and there's been a lot of budget cuts. One of the first things that go, unfortunately, is library systems for whatever reason. Uh, help bolster that, um, bringing lecturers into the space, and allowing for, you know, greater knowledge or greater understanding of, for the particular community, whatever it is they need. So what you can do is you can go to the Friends of the Library and say, I have a series of collection of books that I would like to bring to the library system. Or you can say, I would like to be able to, in some shape or form, you know, speak to within my library community. Uh, you know, lecture and talk to people about Bitcoin. How do I go about to do that? How do I rent the space? Now you can use the Friends of the Library or you can do it on your own. You go to the library directly and say, hey, what, what it takes to re rent a, a meeting space? This is what I want to do. If you want to work within the system, you can use the system to be able to broaden, you know, I think your reach instead of doing it on your own. But that's another way you can talk to them and they can find a way to help you, you know, bring a book into the collection faster than say going straight to the librarian. It doesn't always happen that way but a lot of times it does get things you know sped up. Uh, the third thing is you don't want to deal with people maybe you don't want to deal with anything like that you could just take this book you can drop it into the into a library box like I'm about to do right now And that's it. It gets taken care of. The system does what it does. The friends of the library get the book. They decide either maybe they could put it for sale or maybe they should, you know, the librarian looks at it and says, we need this book for our collection. It brings the process and it brings the book into the collection. Um, just Google, go to your local library and you'll see there's not that many Bitcoin books already exist in the library system. So this is a way for you, a simple step, a simple thought process very simple just buy a bunch of library buy a bunch of internet books buy the dvds either directly talk to the librarian hand them over say hey i think these should be in the collection suggest ask for the suggestion to bring it into the collection hand it to the friends of the library your local friends of the library librarian or just drop the dvds and books right in the book drop and it can be taken care of and th that way come january 2018 this is a bit of a process or maybe towards the end of december people can go to the library and they can start looking and go, oh, I've been hearing about this Bitcoin stuff. They see that DVD documentary. I'm gonna watch that. Or they see the book is on display. Or maybe they go through the financial section and they look and see, oh, you do have a Bitcoin book here. I need a dummy stuff on about Bitcoin. Or I wanna know more about cryptocurrency. Most of the books out there are about Bitcoin. Master of Bitcoin by Andre Anonopoulos is another one. There's two volumes of that. Master of Ethereum is coming out soon or sometime next year. These are things or these are ways I think just a small step to help bring awareness, bring understanding, spread the good word of Bitcoin, spread the good word of cryptocurrency, and allow people to have access to knowledge and understanding without really all that much effort on your part as a person. is trying to be as simple as possible to get the word out there. So I have a link in the show notes to a bunch of books that you can purchase. 
uh, so do the same thing to either drop it off in, the, in your library box or maybe give it to the friends of the library or at least have a list of books that you can suggest to your local librarian as something that needs to be put in the catalog these are movies that need to be put in catalog you know this is something financial information this is something that people need to be aware of or know about and you know get a group get as many people requesting it as you can so that way that the, the library library system knows that there is a demand of it and there is a demand of it. People have a need to know this and this is just another avenue for them to gain access to that information. So that's it, that's my thoughts, that's my idea about how to spread the good word of crypto, of cryptocurrency, of Bitcoin. Thank you very much for listening. Until next time, to the moon.